Hi there, I'm Alex and welcome back to Ukes of Alex, the ukulele channel where we try and dive headfirst into ukulele and ukulele culture, absorb as much as we can, have some fun along the way. And today we're going to take a look at something that's really near and dear to my heart, something that I've really wanted to talk about in depth since the summer. But I just couldn't bring myself to get the camera out when I had an opportunity and talk about it because there's quite a bit of myth and legend attached to it and not a great deal of tangible fact that I can use in a video. And from what I've learned while researching this ukulele brand over the last five years, it's that really anybody can say anything on the internet and it could be presented as fact, even if it's just slightly wrong or you know, there's not really anything to back it up there anymore. I've also learned that the internet isn't as permanent as we think. There's a fantastic website called Lardy's Ukulele Database that talks about this brand and talks about many other historical instruments from, well, anywhere up to the last 115 years of ukulele history. But some of the pages from that website have been lost to the ethers and dark corners of the internet and also some other websites and old listings that have well-researched information no longer exist, at least in a way that I can find them. Today we're going to talk about a ukulele that has Bournemouth, my hometown, in the label, made in Bohemia sometime between 1910 and 1932. We're going to talk about Daviki ukuleles. So what do we actually know about Alder de Vicky and his ukulele company? Well, the legend of Alder de Vicky, he's known locally as a Hungarian nobleman, but he was actually more likely born locally to his shop in Christchurch. Uh, he obviously had some kind of talent for importing goods to the UK around the time of the First World War. And if you had a music shop back then, it was quite likely that you taught too. Uh, so when doing my research, I actually managed to find two examples of people who learned mandolin from Aldair in the early 1910s and just in, the, I think, going into where their parents went off to join the First World War. The thing I found hard to prove when researching this video was a claim that's in dozens of different online articles, blogs and references to Taviki that he was the first man to import Martin guitars and ukuleles to the UK. I can't find any kind of sales receipts or tickets anywhere online that reference the early days of Martin in the UK. I did find reference in the big Martin book that said that they were bought into London, but nothing about Daviki. And the thing that makes me extra dubious is that Daviki did import instruments, but he always made sure they had a label in. So if you were to Google Daviki Gibson Mandolin, you would find plenty of references to Daviki's address at 1 Stratford Road in Bournemouth, um, Soul Trader, Daviki and Sons. So everything that had a Gibson you know, a Gibson name on it would also have this stamp inside the label that said that it was a Daviki imported Gibson. And I think whether it's ego or whether it was something that was required, I think we would see more Martin instruments have that if he'd actually been the man to do it. It could well be that he had the supply links and he was bringing in Martins, but all we can really do is rely on hearsay from the time and maybe at some point in the last hundred years, as can happen, Gibson morphed to Martin in the kind of consciousness of people parroting back information about Daviki. Who knows? So what do we know? Well, we know that he either had offices, a shop or a home at 1 Stratford Road in Bournemouth. He has living relatives that I've actually spoken to a couple of times over the last decade. And the only information they really have is that they believe that the shop was on Stratford Road. But some online material says it was in Boscombe at the Burlington Arcade. The only problem with that is that it lacks kind of local knowledge. There, there is a Royal Arcade in Boscombe. Burlington Arcade is actually just down the road from Stratford Road in Bournemouth. So it's not unreasonable to assume that maybe the office or Daviki's home was at Stratford Road and his shop was just down the road in the Burlington Arcade. And 
we know that he traded between 1910 and 1932. So how old is the instrument? Well, that's the really hard thing to decipher. Inside the label, it says made in Bohemia, which traditionally when looking at other things like violins from the time meant that it was probably made before 1918. The issue there is that that means that someone in Bohemia or Daviki or somebody who wrote the spec for that instrument probably invented the tenor ukulele 10 years before Kamaka did. Now I also think it's pretty unreasonable to assume that the tenor ukulele was actually invented in Bournemouth, England, no matter how cool that would make the destination of the Southern Ukulele Store. But if you look at pottery or musical instruments made in that time period, commonly the made in Bohemia thing would be referenced between kind of well, up to 1918. I do think it's quite likely that Daviki made his own labels for his instruments and put them in because there's quite a lot of inf misinformation about how things are labelled up. So occasionally something's labelled up as a style one, but actually the spec is more like a style two. Sometimes he's labelled up style threes or style fours. And that sounds to me like a salesman who had stuff in stock and wanted to kind of sell them to people that wanted to buy a certain thing in the days before the internet. And uh, it's also entirely likely that the instrument was made any time up to 1932. But it became very, very difficult for countries to trade after 1920, 1921. The fallout from the First World War made it quite difficult for things to come from that um, uh, Austro-Hungarian uh, Republic. The more research I do, the more I find that actually many things just weren't manufactured or imported into the UK from abroad between the 1920s and 1930s because it was very difficult in the fallout from World War I. A lot of the supply chains that were in place just, just weren't there anymore. And uh, also there was a kind of split allegiance. I think it might not have been trendy to say something was made in Bohemia come the mid-1920s. So I believe that the Daviki ukuleles that we see, although commonly referred to as a 1930s instrument, were probably made between 1918 and the early 1920s. And it's entirely possible that Daviki had nearly all of these in one go and then just sold them off over a very, very long period of time. Now you've probably been looking at close-ups of this ukulele the entire time I've been speaking to allow me to do very quick cuts and edits and stop it from being boring. But let's just take a closer look at it now because for me it might be one of the most beautiful instruments I've ever held. I absolutely love binding and rosettes and decoration and it's impossible not to love the intricate detail of these early rope bindings. There's something very European about this ukulele, something very, I don't know, like romantic period instrument. It doesn't have the trappings and lack of imagination that modern instruments have. It's rooted very much in its own past, so the 1800s instruments that came from the 17 and 1800s, that massive rosette. And it's very clearly not actually a tenor ukulele. This ukulele has more of a concert body to it. When you look at it, it's an elongated body and the scale length for the instrument is 16 inches. So it's just a tiny bit smaller than your average tenor. But it plays and sounds much more like, um, much more like a concert in my opinion anyway. It has some snap to it. It's more percussive than a tenor ukulele tends to be. Let's look at some of the details. So you have a slotted headstock there. And I'm very lucky this one has the original tuners, that two on a plate tuners there with very early, um, Bakelite style buttons. The posts have bent a little bit over time, but the tuners have held up really, really well. You have a, actually on this, it measures a 35 mil nut width, but I've seen them being measured as 33, 34, but 35 mil nut width with a very unique U shape to the neck. So the neck has almost a flat point, well, a distinctive flat point on the back of it. And then you have white mother of pearl dots going up the fingerboard. And then in that sound hole, that detail that hopefully I've managed to get in great detail for you, the inside label that denotes this as a style fall. The top is spruce, almost certainly spruce. Spruce just goes this lovely color after a hundred years. <laughs> um, and it has been well played and well loved over the years. I, I still have the original case for it. 
um, wrapped up nicely in my loft. I should get that out to show you a close up of that. And it has a pin bridge. I did some research into pin bridges on instruments and they were really only being introduced in the decade leading up to this. So it's quite a forward thinking instrument really for the time it was manufactured. And the saddle is actually a piece of fret wire rather than a bone nut and saddle like you would get on a modern instrument. But you do have a bone nut at the top. The back on this instrument is actually a double back. So there's a one piece rosewood back, which is, you can almost see inside, it's different wood. It's very hard to do that without shining light in it, but it looks like the inside is birch and the outside is rosewood, which I suppose you could argue is lamination, but I actually think that this is more of a kind of cap on a birch solid. They're both solid pieces glued together without a kind of third piece to make it the sandwich that it needs to be like on a mod, mod like on a modern laminate instrument and you have front and back binding which anyone who views my channel regularly knows I just love I'll close today by saying that what I love most about this instrument is that it feels completely new in my hands. This instrument doesn't feel a hundred years old, like so many other things that I've held and played in my job in the past. This ukulele could well be here in a hundred years time and somebody else could be making a video about it long after this video has been lost to the dark corners of the internet. But for now, I'm going to leave you with another sound sample of this Daviki Style 4. And if you have any kind of reference point or any information about your own Davikis or people you know, please do leave a comment. Let's make this video the central hub for people out there looking at Davikis, wanting to know more. And uh, I really hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, give it a like, give us a, give us a subscribe and check back more readily for more ukulele content. Thanks again.